Hey team, thank you so much for joining us today. And today I'm gonna to sit down and talk with a writer and astrologer extraordinaire, Patrick Watson, um, author of patrickwatsonastrology.com. <clears throat> thank you so much for joining me here today, Patrick. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me, <laughs> Ryan. All right, so Patrick, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you kind of got started with astrology um, and sort of briefly your, your rise to where you are today. <laughs> Uh, all right. Yeah, sure. So the quick bio is basically I came into astrology through my, through my, my mother. She had oh. taken astrology courses in the 70s and she had a big astrology book collection. And uh, I uh, was always curious about my horoscope, but I wasn't sure which sign I was in because sometimes it would say, you know, uh, that I was a sun in Libra. Other times it would, it would seem to indicate that I was a sun in Scorpio. So I asked my mother if I was a Libra or a Scorpio, and she told me that I was a Libra. So that was when I learned that it, you know, came down to the specific time that you were born, you know, that told you whether or not your sun might be in one sign or another. So um, that uh, time passed, and around like 14 to 15 or so, probably around my Saturn opposition, mm -hmm. I... Uh, I devoured my mother's uh, book collection and I uh, started reading the charts of my brothers and my family and my friends uh, at school. And uh, I kind of became known as like the, the astrology guy in high school. I remember after school, like people would come to me and uh, like ask me to look at their charts for them. So that was kind of um, uh, the, the very beginning of uh my uh, career in astrology, I guess, mm -hmm. but uh, I then uh, got on MySpace and I connected with uh, Chris Brennan and Nick Dagan Best and others on the uh, MySpace horoscopic astrology group. And I believe you might have been uh, there. Probably towards the very end, yeah. Yeah, towards the end, yeah, I think you were there. So um, that was when I, that's when my studies really <laughs> took another leap forward when I was introduced to traditional astrology and, and Hellenistic astrology. And so I went to my first con uh conference uh, around 17 and or 18 i think it was 18 it was 2006 so i um yeah i became just so ensconced by that and then when i got to college i wrote co-wrote uh this political astrology blog with chris mm -hmm. um around 21 and and what I, year was that that was in that was at the very beginning of 2009 okay so we're kind of at the i guess we could say we're close to the jupiter return mm -hmm. of uh that time when i began uh blogging and so i did that through college and i was kind of divided over whether or not i was going to continue my studies in astrology or in music um and i couldn't really decide but i ended up deciding to go ahead with music and uh, I was sort of doing astrology on a, on a part-time basis and writing articles on my own site uh, by that point after I graduated in 2011. And I uh, began doing uh, more uh, paid readings closer to the end of my 20s. And then I was finally able to make the switch from doing astrology part-time, switching away from my job as a music teacher to doing astrology full-time um, last uh, November 2018. So uh, I've been doing astrology now full time uh, since that time. And uh, I've just become more and more uh, busy. And I, I made um, videos on YouTube and I did a lot of articles uh, on my website and uh, horary, electional, rectification, natal uh, services and consultations. So that is how I started and how I kind of ended up where I am now. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so speaking more, you know, where you are now, um, now your focus is primarily, you know, your, it seems to be your professional practice and maintaining your writing. Yeah, I would really like to continue my writing. My writing, I used to be a bit more prolific, mm -hmm. but uh, I have become very thankfully uh, uh, quite a bit busier with, <laughs> uh, with clients. Um, so I, uh, I am currently in the process of figuring out how to better manage my time so that I can kind of devote energy to both. Cause I really like um, practicing astrology with, with clients. Number one, it's an, it's always an amazing source of wonder and awe that you get at the astrological phenomenon, you know, continually presenting itself in ever more interesting and novel ways. Um, and uh, you can only really get that by talking with the person whose yeah. chart it is and, and, you know, kind of tracking the, uh, the various cycles that uh, 
are outlined by the Chas and uh, that kind of time out the the uh, the beats of their life. And I also love it because, um, you know, I, I never get out. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's like I do get to talk to people, you know. A little bit. Um, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I guess in that way I'm a bit more social. But, um, uh, yeah, it's – it's um, it's really really cool. I mean, my my basically yeah, my main uh, my main activities right now are to, uh, visiting with clients and talking about their needle charts, or electing important times for them to begin things, or answering the horror questions, or rectifying their birth times if they don't know the birth times, and uh, in between that somehow also trying to uh, you know put out some of my uh, predictions and articles and things that uh, interest me. Right. Yes. And I've always really been a big fan of your articles. One, because they're not small. <laughs> they're not small things, which is great. Um, they're very in-depth. You know, you can kind of, you hefty can follow pamphlets. hefty pamphlets. Um, you can follow really well what you're doing. Um, and so as somebody who has been kind of a longtime reader of your articles, um, I think I can successfully say that they fall within like one of three kind of categories. I, I, wow. I'm amazed <laughs> at this analysis of my articles. Yes. Um, like none of this is going to be super mind blowing analysis, but the first <laughs> is of course um, your work on um, of course, political figures, obviously kind of a, a, a continuation of your work for the political astrology blog. Yeah. So you do a lot of work with them. The second one is work on sort of like larger planetary cycles that you yeah. like dig into. You'll look back at the history for when things happen, what was going on um, and kind of like, so what's good, what's, <laughs> To be continued, what's the yeah. future of this? Yeah. Who knows? Because it's all crazy and you can't really explain <laughs> it until it happens, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the third one is arguably kind of my favorite. It's like the um, the kind of like sarcastic commentary ones. Uh, most recently, if you have planets in fall oh or detriment, Lord. you are doomed. <laughs> right. Not yeah. Kind of so those would be my favorites, I think. But of course, the the uh, your work with uh, political figures uh, and with cycles are also are obviously very impressive. Um, Thank you very but, much. It's very uh, kind of you to say. But your uh, but but the more like the more like sarcastic commentary ones are. Uh, are great, especially because that one is fun. That if you have plants in fall or fall or detriment, you're doomed. Um, because part of me is just like, man, I'm imagining like the blowback from this from people who just read the title, like, like who just right, read the yeah, title. Right? Yeah, it's such a, it's such a bait. Like, <laughs> it's such a clickbait. <laughs> and they were like, I can't believe you would say this to people uh, and just like get all upset on social media. Don't even read anything about it, but just get upset about the title. Yeah. You and, have to read past the title. <laughs> and then also like the Photoshopping skills. Oh my gosh. Of, of like Kratos <laughs> in like a fancy dinner party. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I guess I picked up a little, a little uh, uh, Photoshopping slash photo editing skills here, here and there. Um, Credits to to pixelar.com um, <laughs> and uh, Pixabay for the royalty free images. Excellent. Um, <laughs> so since we've name dropped this, and since I've name dropped this article a little bit, um, the the if you have planets and fall or detriment, you're doomed. Give us the elevator pitch for oh. this article for people who <laughs> well, are who know that we're not just like making fun of people who have planets yeah, and yeah. <laughs> yeah the basic idea is actually making fun of the idea that people are doomed if they have these placements and it just um i think we tend to think of planets in detrimental fall as being planets which are like weak or bad but i would say more that they're just in environments which are not suited to their skills and that in some ways while those planets are in unwelcome or hostile environments that they are still in a way needed you know by those uh environments you know for example you know libra is a sign ruled by venus and we would maybe associate this with like a dinner party and mars is kind of out of place because it's supposed to be polite at a dinner party you have to be you know, gracious, you know, but Mars is not. And so Mars kind of struggles in this, in this kind of environment, but there is a way in which uh, Mars can uh, use it. The very, uh, it's very, the very dissonance of its placement, you know, as a way of um, uh, advancing or reconciling with this, 
uh, with this difference and that really Mars in some ways is needed. Sometimes you can't always be nice, you know, mm, sometimes sure. you can't always be gracious. Sometimes there is uh, a, a necessity for being that kind of counter um, counterpoint, you know, to the uh, situation of your, of your environment. So uh, that's, that's the, that's the main idea. And, Sometimes you know, a crazy uncle jokes. says something at the dinner table and you got to shut him down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Sometimes decorum is not worth everything. So I would say that, you know, although Venus and Saturn, you know, do well in the sign, would say that Sun and Mars are still needed there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they may not be very welcome, but they are sort of necessary. There's a necessary role for being that kind of uh, counter agent. So if you're watching this and you have a planet in fall or detriment, please go read that article to give yeah. you some hope about those placements, which we will, of course, <laughs> include in the description uh, here below. There was, actually a, there was actually a part two to that, but I <laughs> oh, released them all as, I released all of those images as just memes on Twitter. I decided not to do oh, it no. as Oh, no. Okay, uh, well, but, uh, give me that, maybe I'll, maybe give me that I'll Twitter do link. And, <laughs> <laughs> sure. and yeah. we can be like part two now. And yeah, yeah, that. there you go. <laughs> um, so, okay, so that's more your your sarcastic commentary taking a thing, let's talk about it uh, with ridiculous images. Um, <laughs> but jokes. so you first said that you got started writing uh, with the political astrology blog around yeah. 2009. So this is early Obama administration. That's right. Um, what were your, what were your, what was your focus more on then? Was it more just like examining the lives of political uh, figures or is it more just like a bit more like step back mundane, like um, forecasting for like more the nation as well, a whole, like with the Sibley chart or something. Yeah, I, you know, my approach <laughs> to mundane astrology is is kind of different. I feel like there are two, there are two kind of different theories of time that is are posited by astrology. I feel like we can look at time as a particle or time as a wave. And I think when we think of time as a particle, you know, as a distinct point, that's where we get all these disagreements about you know, what is the proper chart of the United States? You know, is it when the declaration was signed? It, was it at the uh, declaration of, for taking up arms, which is about a year earlier? Or maybe we could say it was the ratification of the constitution, you know, which are several years later. So I don't, I don't think any of those times are invalid, um, but then how do we reconcile the fact that they're all different? So I take a, when it comes to like, uh, national histories and uh, political events, I tend to take a more wave view of time where, you know, we can make sense of the emergence of the United States as a political entity, not by defining this a particular point in time when it emerged, but um, kind of taking the emergence of the United States as a whole, that phenomenon um, from a kind of broader point of view. And it's at that point that we can see, oh, you know, the first colony was established in North America, Jamestown, when Uranus was in Gemini. And the United, then the, the colonies got together and rebelled against uh, the, uh, uh, the British, you know, when Uranus entered Gemini. And then 84 years later, the country divided against itself in a civil war when Uranus was in Gemini. And then 84 years after that, uh, they, uh, the, the, the U.S. goes to war against uh, fascism in the in the forties at D-Day. You know, happened when Uranus was in Gemini. Of course, this is kind of unsettling now, thinking that we are come now coming up to this Uranus return again um, in Gemini. But I think it's and hey, there's that's, fascism. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a, well, I guess, but I, but I think what this shows is like there's a way you can kind of make sense of. The passage of time without necessarily having to refer back to a specific chart. It's not that I think they're unimportant or that you can't get really good insights from them, but I tend to take a wider lens view because I have not been able to decide whether it should be the Sibley chart or a Scorpio rising chart. I think there's just so many different options that it's just required a different approach. And that's at least for me. Other people may have more compelling arguments for a particular chart over another, but um, uh, I probably didn't, I didn't think I answered your question though. <laughs> you, uh, I think you said, um, what, uh, what Where you was focus my, more on like what was people more on? or more like events, which, <laughs> I, but this is actually interesting because that explains kind of how you got more into your second type 
of articles more about like the cycles yeah. kind of like well, how you got well and that's that's true because because yeah because the the work on political figures lives like that is very much the particle view you know i mean really granular looking at the lots and and Zodaka releasing which is such an intricate technique so in that case we're really burrowing down deep into the you know the granular details of a particular moment that someone emerged um Whereas, yeah, you're exactly right. The the other view of, of time is this more wave time. And so I just, I mean, it sounds kind of dumb when I break it down like this, but basically just look at what happened before and how it coincides, how the same sort of themes sort of come up. So for example, with Jupiter and Capricorn, I look back at the previous times of Jupiter and Capricorn and I started noticing that there was um, this theme of movements for justice and mercy in uh like um prison reform and you know the advent of probation and parole and so that gave me the confidence to be able to say that one of the big political issues of 2020 would be the would be freedom for prisoners in ways that were kind of controversial and so it's really interesting because i didn't realize it would take on the dimension that it did but jupiter being conjunct pluto in capricorn in 2020 you know that was when uh, people were debating whether or not to release prisoners on mass because of COVID-19. And in fact, in some countries, they actually did have to release, um, I think in Iran, uh, they released like hundreds of thousands of prisoners um, to, to stop the spread of COVID-19. So this, uh, and actually even before the pandemic, uh, there were also really controversial bail reforms in New York uh, that generated a lot of controversy. So it's, it's interesting too, because Jupiter is in fall in Capricorn. And I think it's always difficult to advocate for the rights of prisoners because in some cases, right, they, so, really yeah. have been, they really have done things wrong in That's some true. cases. So, that, so there's, a, there's a really big tension between Jupiter's place in Capricorn. So I think it's a really vivid example of how Jupiter has fallen in, in, in Capricorn because Jupiter is advocating for the extension of mercy or justice or forgiveness, but to people who- The people that we've like literally thrown away throw in a away. hole somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So in some cases we may empathize with you know, uh, Jupiter, but in other cases, we may say We're like, Oh, I don't know, Jupiter, far. that's a bit. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting, like also hearing that, um, that I think, you know, the pandemic also kind of put on hold this idea of like, legalizing marijuana and expunging criminal records from people who have, you know, obviously yeah, been, been no. dealt a really shitty hand by the war on drugs and things like that as another and that's something that, you know, kind of we talk about every now and again, but it really seemed to get kind of picked up because, you know, the people that did get released um, from prisons due to COVID concerns were, you know, obviously nonviolent drug offenders. Right. For yeah, who no, most exactly. are going to be people with marijuana convictions. Uh, so that's fun to see how that came. Yeah, how that it's, comes back. it's really. Uh, but now so, Jupiter in Capricorn is going to be super mad if it happens, if it gets passed while Jupiter is in Aquarius. Yeah, so I, I still have to release all my stuff on Jupiter and Aquarius. But uh, uh, but yeah, that's kind of where that comes from is just looking at time more as a wave, you know, and I think sometimes we can get it. It's, it's tricky because sometimes time acts in both ways in the same way that we can't really tell whether matter acts as a particle or a wave. I think time kind of acts like that too, because sometimes we might look at the exact return, you know, of Jupiter to a particular place and we may be kind of unimpressed with the results, but other times the Jupiter return can be like huge, um, you know, and, uh, and it really does sort of come down to that sort of precise timing, but you can also see the general relevance. Such a, I guess it's like, you know, the difference between a transit by degree versus by sign, um, you know, that's- Yeah, I think that's a good analogy for it. <clears throat> Excellent. Degrees and particles, waves and signs. Whoa, that's the sign. <laughs> like that's the title of a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talking about um, you know burrowing in on individuals' lives. Uh, so you name dropped the technique zodiacal releasing, um, something that people who have read what you do are probably going to be somewhat familiar with. People who have not are not. What's the elevator sure. pitch <laughs> in so much yeah, as possible okay. for the yeah. medical releasing? <laughs> All right. Basically, it, it is a technique which divides your life up into a book, and each book has a different uh, topic and a different story. And each story is divided into further, tinier stories, into sentences and paragraphs. Um, and just like a book, there can be foreshadowings and payoffs and uh, building up periods and, and climaxes and, and reversals. And there can be 
small things which happened earlier in the story, which can come back in a more profound way. Uh, so it really, uh, that's, that's what Zodiacal releasing can do. It can predict the, um, the development of certain topics in someone's life and the, the height of activity uh, in, in of uh, particular topics in one's life and uh, how things relate back to previous times in, in one's life. So when you say topics, cool. what exactly do you mean? So uh, <clears throat> there are different, there are different uh, topics you can apply this technique to. So one of some of those common are the lot of fortune, which pertains to uh, circumstances and things that just happen to the body versus the lot of spirit, which is more about like your actions and your, um, your career, what you do, um, how you're motiva motivated to act, or the lot of errors, which is, you know, what you think it is about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there are, there are other lots as well, the, the seven hermetic lots, but it's, it's conceivable that you could apply this to uh, any lot, I suppose. So Zadok releasing divides life up into these different periods um, based off of a topic described by a lot. So if you wanted to look into maybe health concerns or accidents to the body, you would look to a lot of fortune. If you're more concerned with um, what an individual was going to do, primarily in our current culture uh, through career, it tends to be how it's most normally manifest or looked at, you're going to spirit. So I imagine a lot of your work involves spirit more so mostly, than fortune. Mostly, yeah, mostly spirit. <laughs> Um, although it can get complicated. <laughs> okay, how so? Yeah, well, because sometimes what one does is with one's body. Um, you know, so, uh, for example, a construction worker, you know, these aren't activities of the mind, they're activities of the body, mm -hmm. but it is their mode of work. So it can get tricky, uh, you know, or if someone is a, a dancer, you know, then okay. what they do is with their body, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, but so or or, or so there's athlete. like an overlap in an extent between there like are, the health and the health and uh, vigor of one's body versus like with the trajectory of one's career. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's a huge um, there's definitely a, a semi permeable kind of barrier between the versions <laughs> of of what's what's truly circumstantial versus what's truly a result of one's actions. So yeah, sure. it's, it, it's, it's tricky. It's oh, that's a philosophical debate there. Um, yeah, right. So working with the lots um, implies that birth time is super important, uh, which I guess explains why you also end up doing a lot of rectification professionally um, <laughs> as well to get those lots as accurate as possible. Um, and so working with political figures and with Zodiacal releasing, um, how easy is that? Well, one of the reasons I like to use political figures for using this technique is because they usually have a record of, you know, races they've run and they, there's no ambiguity, right? They either, true, yeah. wa they either, they won it or they lost. Um, <laughs> not, of course, not all election losses are necessarily bad for someone's life. It just kind of depends on what sort of leads, you know, what it leads to next, but that's kind of one of the reasons I like using uh, politicians is because they usually have a, a record of distinct like victories or, or losses. And so it becomes easier to identify like which sequences might belong to explaining a victory type scenario as opposed to a loss type scenario. And this is also really fascinating because then there's always, you know, a new election coming, you have like yeah, yeah. fresh data, you know, coming in every so often. <laughs> fresh meat. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so so uh, yeah, it, th this is also, um, yeah, this technique also requires you to uh, have a pretty precise birth time. It also depends. I mean, in some cases, like if a lot is near a sign boundary, then you would really have to evaluate, okay, you know, is this time more likely to be accurate? You know, especially if it sounds like it could be a rounded time, like if it's close to the hour. Mm -hmm. um, we just know that recorded birth times, even AA rated birth times can be overrepresented you know, at the hour. So there's definitely some rounding going on. Um, right. There was like a, was it you who put that together? That image? It's no, that, was that like image, a graph. that is, that comes from, I wish, uh, I wish I could remember her name. I can picture uh, it clearly, but I cannot uh, remember. <laughs> I, I will give you, I will give it to you and you can put the link up, but it, yeah. it's a really amazing article that she, what Renee Oshop, Renee Oshop is her name. Um, 
and uh, she put together the all of like the AA rated data by birth minute, and it's way overrepresented at the hour, like way more than it should be by chance. Right. And then it kind of goes down the further down you go. So the half hour mark is also overrepresented, but less so than the hour and, and so forth with every minute birth minute that ends in a five or zero. Right. So it just underscores the degree to which we have to be really um, in some, like, especially when you're using such a granular technique, like Sadaka releasing to make sure that that birth time is correct. So the positions of the lots are <laughs> a, um, you know, should be. And it, the, this is cool too, because you can often use Zadok releasing then to potentially narrow down a, uh, what the birth time might be. If there are two potential options, then you can basically see like, oh, if a lot of spirit is in this sign, then it would indicate, you know, peak periods happening here and here and here. Does that match? No, it doesn't. Or oh, yes, it does. Um, but it can get super tricky. Right. So um, for those who weren't super familiar, talking, describing birth times as like AA, what we mean is like the run rating system where uh, if somebody is given a, a double A or an AA rating, it means that we have like a copy of their birth certificate with a birth time written on it by a doctor or nurse or something from like when they were born. But as we were discussing, uh, sometimes they don't exactly... Uh, check their watch as they should. And so we'll see where people are saying that like, oh, I was born at 8 a.m. And that's what my birth certificate says. But we just have like way more people born at the hour than should be, assuming everybody has, right. a, has an equal chance to be born at any minute. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so working with zodiacal releasing um, for these political figures, you know, you your, I guess your basic method is to um, look at how things kind of went in the past and then look for things coming up to be like, okay, these two periods of time ought to be similar in some easily co comparable way. Yeah, it usually is pretty comparable. Like when it's, you know, I mean, I guess sometimes it can be more subtle, but I mean, mm -hmm. I also don't want to force comparisons sure. where they may not exist. Um, so there are some cases where this shows up in, in really stunning <laughs> ways where, you know, what happened earlier in someone's life is like a direct you know, foreshadowing of, of what, of that same type of dynamic in their life, but happening in, on a kind of larger level. Um, so it, it it's um, one other thing you need to do this kind of research is you need to do a lot of reading basically about that person's mm -hmm. life. So, you know, my Google play account, <laughs> there's like tons of books, you know, that I've like biographies, kind of half, <laughs> yeah, half skimmed. Yeah. Well, and you have to be careful with autobiographies because you don't know how the person wants to present themselves. And uh, sometimes there's things you can get though, for even from a source, which might be more biased, there's still some important things that you can kind of glean um, from uh, about a person's life. Like, uh, even if they're trying to cast them in the best light, there are still some things you might be able to latch onto as like, okay, well, this was like a distinct positive, or this was a, mm -hmm. you know, um, this, this, there's sometimes things beyond the text, even, you know, that you can kind of infer about someone. But uh, I try to stick to the dates, you know, of like mm -hmm. when things happened and the most undisputable, you know, kind of version of events. And um, it, uh, yeah, it can lead you to make some really interesting observations about things that could happen to them later. Mm -hmm. it, and it's especially weird when it doesn't actually make sense. Okay. Like, like when you, <laughs> like, it's especially with, like in, in cases where you can't imagine why someone would, you know, uh, why are you doing so well? Well, yeah. Well, you know, because really, because like, for example, I saw like in, um, in Romney's chart back in 2012, you know, he was at this big uh, Leo period or whatever, which was contacting the ruler of the spirit. I mean, it was basically why he lost the 2012 election. But the weird part is that I could see kind of down the road um, in 2018, he reached a loosing of the bond to cancer that mirrored when he won the 2012 primary. Now, initially, I... I was I was wrong in thinking that it was going to be a redo basically of his like running for president or something. Mm -hmm. um, although he did try, <laughs> he there are there are articles that show that he had uh, inquired about making a primary run against uh, Trump for the 2020 mm -hmm. election. But um, 
but the way that it worked out is basically the uh, the loosing of the bond in Romney's chart was his election as the Utah senator. And usually, when like in in part in in the recent past, you know, someone losing an election, someone losing a presidential election, usually that person doesn't return to public service in any way. You wouldn't sure. expect necessarily. And and plus, he was in his sixties. You know, he wasn't um, a spring chicken. Yeah, he was this big chicken, so it would have been harder to imagine. It would be hard to imagine in 2012, after having just lost, that he would actually find his way back into a position of prominence. But so in 2012, I was kind of going like, okay, yeah, he's losing, you know, this this time. But I'm like, but I'm wondering what's what's the 2018 election all about? Like, what? Mm-hmm. Why is that? Why is he kind of going back into this sort of more prominent period of political activities that he's been involved with last time? Because when he experienced the same period on a lower level back in 2000, um, sorry, in 2002, that was when he was elected governor of Massachusetts. So it's like, okay, what is happening? You know, <laughs> why, why would this? So it didn't, it was counterintuitive in 2012 to think that he would be, um, you know, in a position of prominence again. And he, he totally did. I mean, he—that's exactly what happened when the when he reached the losing of the bond to cancer. He he won the uh, Utah uh, senatorship, and he um, he kind of had a more. The other really cool thing about the the contrast between these two periods is in the foreshadowing period, he was reaching the head of the GOP, but in the loosing of the bond, he became its pariah. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, right. <laughs> like, because he was like the one senator to stand up against Trump and, and vote, you know, against him in the, uh, in the uh, impeachment <laughs> so, from his own party. So it's, uh, it's, it's a really stunning, you know, uh, contrast. And it's especially interesting too, because I think there's a degree to which, I mean, maybe this is more inference, but I feel like in some ways he was, um, I don't know. He, the way he's talked about his uh, resistance to Trump has been in terms of how he feels freed, and you know, mm-hmm. his his in his conscience, he feels like he's doing the right thing, and he's freed from like the shackles right. Loosening of partisanship. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's like what <laughs> you know. So we can sort of get the impression like, oh, he was like you know really holding back in some ways as a presidential candidate, but now he's. He's freed, you know. Mm-hmm. His his spirit literally is kind of <laughs> more loosed. He's he's just you know going where he's you know he's vibing. He's vibing. Um, <laughs> In so, so much as a sixty something year old man can. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um, so it's those kinds of those kinds of insights which you can get into someone's life that um, can tell you about things that happen later. And it's weird, especially when you don't anticipate that anything more would happen. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. there are things with Trump that he, uh, if he provided he lives through, you know, the next, uh, several years, uh, that he will be living out kind of things that he has previously, uh, done, you know, the, the 2028 election, for example, oh is something I would not expect him to be involved in at all. Right. Right. If anything, we might think 2024, he might try to run again. But at this point, it would make absolutely no sense to say that he would run in 2028. But according to this technique, 2028 is the year that he that corresponds to when he ran as an independent. He left the Republican Party at the Mm -hmm. end of 2011 and decided to run as an independent. And that process starts taking shape in 2027, Mm -hmm. uh, according to this technique. So um we'll have to see yeah <laughs> you can rub it in my face if i'm wrong no, but... not that i'm just thinking like because <laughs> it almost sounds like you know this idea like breaking away from a thing um it almost like to me it would almost seem like he can't do it but maybe he like gets the stage started for like his son or something yeah, and like how could... how that works out because yeah he's he'll be 80 in a couple 80, of years 82 around that time. although <laughs> so the, i just yeah i have a, yeah, yeah i'm there with you like mm, what does this look like um but you know talking about trump and predictions and all this and and zadiga releasing um in 2016 every astrologer was super excited to be able to to predict um you know who they thought was going to win the presidential election you yourself made a prediction um off of that and can you walk us through a little bit of yeah. your of your uh of your of your process, sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So I thought, well, one, I think just to, <laughs> to, to, to spoil the story, I was wrong. 
Um, <laughs> I, I screwed up. I, but it wasn't for not doing the, the technique incorrectly. And that was what really shook me. Mm -hmm. Basically, my approach to uh, what I would expect to see when a politician is going to like win an election is that they that the periods they release to through this you know sequence of uh, ordered signs was that they would reach the signs which are angular to the sign of fortune uh especially the 10th sign of fortune or at least that they would release to like their benefics venus and jupiter or would activate some sort of powerful thing in their chart and that just did not look to be the case in in, in trump's chart because he was actually in a major cadent period relative to spirit, which was tricky because I, I couldn't even account for why he was there at all. And that really should have, <laughs> that really should have been a, a bigger red flag in some ways. Um, and so I couldn't really account for why he was there at all. So I just thought, you know, that combined with my lack of imagination that the country would stoop so low as to elect such as an obviously unfit candidate to the nation's highest office. I, you know, it, it felt it was pretty clear uh, to predict that he he would not win, and I also uh, was using I we didn't have a confirmed birth time for Hillary, and I thought that she might I I kind of went along with the eight oh two a.m. theory of her time because it it has a lot of uh, I guess sort of eminent placements we might associate with it, um, even though there was technically more evidence to point to eight p.m. being the proper time, so I. Uh, I tried to use um, Zodiac releasing on, on uh, Hillary's job with this, with this time, which was unconfirmed. And there was kind of, there were kind of mixed indications, like the, the times that she would be going into from that birth time, like had previously coincided with times of losses and victories. So um, I, given all else that I was thinking, including my own sort of, uh, you know, uh, biases or, or uh, what have you. I, I figured that I didn't, I couldn't quite explain it, but I, I was confident enough to, um, you know, uh, predict that uh, Hillary would win, would win and I was wrong. And this really sent me into kind of a, a weird tailspin after that election because it was my Saturn return. And um, I, I took it pretty hard because I had, uh, I've, I'd seen this technique kind of work over and over again with relative uh, consistency. And so I was really racking my brain, like, how is it possible, you know, that he could have been elected with this cancer period? And people had said a different uh, explanations of how he could have been elected during a Caden period. But it was finally when Chris Brennan uh, alerted me to some of these kind of um, asterisk comments in Valens about how in certain cases one lot might predominate or in other cases from Serapio who says that um, in some cases the lots may switch that I kind of had this realization like you know what if we reversed his lots because if we, if we reversed his lots then there would be uh, then it would change the sign which was the angular sign it would change his sign, his angle, angular signs from the cardinal signs to the mutable signs. And so when I flipped it, I, it, it, it like <laughs> the expectations of the technique live up to what happened because he, when you reverse his lots, the uh, 2016 election is in one of the most angular periods he could possibly be in, in his lifetime. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that I would have been able to overcome enough of my biases to be able to really confidently predict that Trump would have won in 2016 had I done this before the election, but it absolutely would have explained why he was there at all at that level. And it would have been a much stronger case for why he would have won because the the exact time that he won the election corresponds to when he first announced that he was going to run in 2012. Um, so there was kind of a connection between the beginning of that kind of campaign that he started in 2011 and the, and the, the end result of the 2016 campaign. So we were to draw a connection between those times that we would say in back at the beginning of 2011, he was just about to come up with his sort of, you know, Bertha nonsense, basically. That was sort of, but he was on this sort of ascendant rise. But what was great about that 
is it allowed me to project forward. And there was a moment in May 2011 at the beginning of May when uh, uh, Trump was basically humiliated at this dinner and he was, uh, you know, he was made fun of by uh, Seth Meyers and Obama at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And then not only that, but a day after that happened, the death of Osama bin Laden was announced. And this was such a huge crush, I think, to, to, to Trump because he had been making this argument that, like, you know, Obama's like this anti-American, you know, Muslim, and you know, his, his, you know, he's born in Kenya and he's not American. And then Obama comes out and does pretty much the most like sort of stereotypically badass American thing possible, you know, short of riding in on a unicorn with a Big Mac and shooting a shotgun, you know, he killed Osama, you know, gave the order to kill Osama bin Laden. So it was just a few weeks after that, that um, Trump dropped out on May 16th of 2011 and said, you know, even though I, you know, uh, even though, you know, I'm at the top of the polls, uh, you know, I'm dropping out. So uh, he drops out. And that the sequence that he was in at the time that he dropped out on May 16th, 2011, corresponds exactly to uh, a period spanning November 2020. So I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, that's what's going to happen. He, he's going to be similarly kind of humiliated. And like, it's not just a defeat, but like really kind of... Um, you know, in the worst shape, you know, uh, he could be in, you know, it's, it's really like very like, profoundly kind of uh, humiliating. And so I didn't realize that it would go to the lengths that it did because it would be bad enough just losing. You know what? People lose elections. That happens. It's quite another thing to insist that somehow you didn't lose and then continue to, you know, defy this outcome, you know, uh, and to, you uh, you know, to do so without any evidence and without any kind of merit and being, th you know, having case after case thrown out by judges from your own party. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's just sad. Like it's <laughs> to borrow a term, you know, sad, you know, I mean, that, that is pretty sad. And um, uh, it was all seeming, it all seemingly relates back to this, this episode from 2011. Uh, he essentially, essentially the 2020 campaign was like a redux of that small period of time in 2011, where we saw the same kind of dynamic play out. He was on this sort of high, you know, of notoriety, and it all came kind of crashing down in this, you know, um, fire, you know, of hubris. <laughs> so, um, so this is then, I guess, the difference between your... Um, your prediction in 2016 and your prediction for 2020, which you released, you know, like a year before the election even happened, yes. was that you've had this, like this realization that, oh, for Trump, his lots need to be switched. And you're just, so like for now, you're working with this, uh, with this assumption that his lots are switched is what you like. Yes, exactly. So the, yeah, so the, yeah, short version is 2016, I applied the technique as is exactly as, you know, the default, you know, lots, nothing sort of altered. And in 2020, because of what happened in 2016, because I was so profoundly shaken, uh, I was forced to reevaluate my assumptions. Thankfully I did. And I switched his lots, was able to see that this made sense of his life. His whole life became much more intelligible. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, I could account for everything after that point. And so that was really uh, a huge moment. I actually made a video of the, the Donald Trump ZR breakthrough, like the day after I found this, because I was so uh, shook uh, by it because of how radically it changes uh, the, the uh, outcome, you know, of what we would think would have happened. And, and uh, in 2020, I worked with that assumption that they had to be switched and it was correct. In fact, not only was I correct about him losing the election, but I was also able to see previous times that he had quit political races and that particular sequence uh, repeated on November 23rd of 2020 and November 23rd, 2020 was several weeks after the election, but it was actually the, um, that was like the date that, Trump gave basically gave the go ahead for the transition to begin. Right, right, so right. So it was as close as we yes. could get. It's <laughs> as close as we could get to like a you know a concession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though he was still uh, challenging Not in court, conceding. it was yeah, <laughs> it was the closest thing we could get to his. It was some. It was the first uh, material 
you know, thing that happened, which sig- you know signaled that he recognized, you know, what had happened. And um, so it was a tremendous validation of, I think, uh, these kinds of uh, correspondences, which you can investigate through this technique of alcohol releasing. Sure, because I remember being really kind of interested in this idea that um, the lots might need to be switched. Um, so I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about that, because um, I'm familiar with the idea that, like, if somebody is born with both lots of the same sign, you advance spirit to the next sign, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so there, that, there are rules. some yeah, weird rules where if things overlap or something happens where we kind of adjust it. Um, so kind of, was there a sort of like criteria given in the yeah, text about so, when we might want to flip? Yes, exactly. So this is getting a little into the nitty gritty, but I'll keep it as straightforward right. as possible. Um, in the text of Valens, in re- Remember, Valens is the only author we have who we even have any kind of information about this technique at all. Mm-hmm. He's the only person who actually wrote about it uh, explicitly. And so um, he does say that if the Lot of Fortune and or its ruler okay. is unable to witness the Ascendant, okay, thank you. then the other <laughs> Lot may take on the qualities of that Lot. So... Uh, and the same in vice versa. If the lot of spirit and or its ruler is in aversion to the ascendant, or he says, I think falls amiss, which uh-huh. is what I presume he means by that is when it's in aversion to the ascendant, that the, uh, the other lot will take on the signification of those uh, times. He says something like fortune becomes spirit. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's a, so when you apply that, when you apply that analysis to Trump's chart, he has, uh, he was born with Leo rising as far as we know. Sure. Uh, so if he has the lot of fortune in Aquarius, then the Lord that's, that's in, that is, that can see the ascendant by opposition, but the ruler is in the 12th, uh, which is an aversion to the ascendant. So that would be one potential count, uh, against his lot of fortune being able to represent fortune topics. And then similarly with the lot of, with a lot of spirit in Pisces, Pisces is an aversion to Leo and um, the, uh, the ruler is Jupiter, which is only aspects in the ascendant by sextile. So basically when it comes to his fortune and spirit, the default reckoning um, it's uh, he has, you know, one lot's ruler is in aversion to the ascendant and the other lot itself is placed in a house of in a version to the ascendant. So it's not clear like if both criteria need to be met to make this switch or not. Now, one of the other things that is mentioned by Serapio about fortune and spirit and whether or not they should be switched has to do with a kind of qualitative judgment that one makes about the sun and moon. So some of the, uh, one thing I should say before saying this is that Serapio does not talk about Zadaka releasing. There's also no evidence that he even knew about it or was even necessarily like a contemporary of, of uh, Vedius Valens or would know the same people would have access to this technique. However, in one of Serapio's texts, he talks about times when fortune becomes spirit and spirit becomes fortune. And the criteria that he gives um, involve the sect light being in a feminine sign in a downal chart or a masculine sign in a nocturnal chart. So this would potentially apply to like a lot of people, a lot of people, if that was the case. And I honestly have not seen that that matters quite so much. Mm -hmm. Um, So for example, with with Romney's chart, here's the sun in Pisces in a day chart. And uh, I have not seemingly have to have made an adjustment for him. So I don't think that that is necessarily a hard and fast rule. That yeah, because that's kind of uh, extreme. It's pretty extreme. <laughs> um, the other, um, some of the, so a couple of the other things he mentions is uh, if the sect light is not rising in the east. So basically, if the sun is, you know, uh, to the west of the midheaven, um, then we would say the sun doesn't have enough solar qualities <laughs> to represent you know spirit the corresponding lot and uh he he also says if a star is in the bounds of a planet which is out of sect so 
if you're a day chart and you have the sun in the bounds of Mars, Mars is contrary to second the daytime. So we would say that that was another count against the sun being able to be considered as uh, the uh, as a, uh, being effective enough to represent the the uh, the topic of uh, spirit. So you could technically apply all these to the moon as well. I mean, it becomes uh-huh. super c- confusing yeah. because some of these things kind of conflict with each other in some ways and. It's not clear if they even should be applied at all to Zodiacal releasing. Um, but what I thought was really interesting about Trump's chart is Trump does have the sun in the star of a of a of the bounds contrary to sect. He has a sun in the bounds of Mars. What else? Right. Um, <laughs> <Duh>. <laughs> um, and uh, he. But the the really important thing I think in Trump's chart is not just that he has. Um, you know, some of his, uh, you know, his lot of f- uh, spirit in a sign, which is averse to the ascendant and the ruler of his spirit uh, fortune, which is in aversion to the ascendant. But Trump himself was born at a lunar eclipse. Mm-hmm. So if we are, what I think is interesting about Serapio is, while I'm not sure about the specifics of what he's proposing, it is interesting to consider that the, the actual condition of the sun and moon at one's birth could potentially be an indication of how what you might expect from the corresponding lots. Right. This fortune is like the lot of the moon, spirits a lot of the sun. So what happens, you know, in a chart <laughs> where the moon is eclipsed to fortune? Mm-hmm. You know, fortune is a lot of the moon. Well, if the moon's eclipsed, what happens to the moon? I almost, I think there's kind of enough things <laughs> being check, tick, uh, ticked off of these uh, various considerations and their broader implications about, you know, the condition of the sun and moon reflecting their ability to support the topics of the lots they correspond with that it, it seemed like it's not too far a bridge to cross than to say that there could be a reason to go ahead and justify the switch of his lots. And I think the proof is in the pudding because um, even when you release from fortune, like hit the adjusted lot of fortune. So there are the other lot. Uh, his least favorable fortune periods co- do coincide with times where he had kind of more negative health events, um, uh, including like a, a um, he had a, like a boldness reduction surgery during like one of his big Mars periods. Um, and while that's not like on the record, that is that is that was mentioned in a deposition from his wife. <laughs> uh, from his ex-wife uh, that this happened in this time. So I, I, I trust it. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, you know, whereas it just doesn't match up if you're measuring from the other lot, the really his angular periods from spirit show times when he was kind of at the, his uh, height of notoriety or fame. You know, he had his kind of golden period in the eighties where he was a relatively popular figure, which is mm-hmm. during his, uh, Pisces period, which would have activated his benefic of the second in favor, his angular fortune, you know, it was a pretty good time. And then the next time he did that was in 2011, which mm-hmm. was the beginning of his, oh, yeah. you know, his political activities. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right, that's Mercury. interesting. Yeah. So when we're talking like this, and this might be going a little too far into sure, yeah. Stuff, but like when yeah, we're talking about have... like the idea of you know a lot being unable to operate and the other lot taking it taking its job, does it do both? Is that the understanding? So because it that, seems like yeah. on the one hand they're like, oh, if they're in the same sign, you need to separate them so you can get a clearer read on what's happening. Right. But then in they're other, like, oh, yeah. but you know sometimes they just can't. You got to put them together. It's like okay. <laughs> so. Um, I do have an example where one of the lots seems to predominate for both topics. So in, in the chart of Emmanuel Macron, mm-hmm. the, French the French president, president. I, I have an article on him. Basically, uh, he was another example that came, kind of came right off to Trump where a lot of people who use this technique were kind of like, what's happening here? Like he, <laughs> he's in one of his worst periods. How did he win? And this is right on the heels of my work with Trump. So I'm like, hmm, maybe there's a, you know, explanation for that. So uh, when you look at his chart, the ruler of his lot of fortune and spirit um, is Mercury in the 12th. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, there was a potential justification for, you know, considering that there might be some sort of alteration. And when 
you do his default releasing it he ends up in one of his least fortunate periods at the time he was elected president which doesn't make any sense when you only concentrate on one like basically his fortune position and you only use fortune for both considerations he's in his best period <laughs> when mm-hmm. he gets elected you know it's it sort of comes into accordance with expectation mm-hmm. but it's funny though because at the same time it also shows that like I was able to show how the loosing of the bond in his in his chart showed how he um, broke away from working for the French government and started a new political party. So mm-hmm. the the advent of his new political party on Marsh happened over the course of this loosing of the bond. Mm-hmm. Um, breaking and away it was, from something. He was breaking away. Yeah, he was breaking <laughs> away from... He was working for the government and he actually ran against his own boss. Oh, nice. Um, so, <laughs> like, yeah, so pretty kind of a big deal and um but i'll also say that it also captures things which happened to him outside of his control because right after he was elected he went into this really hazardous looking uh mars and leo period and um or it was like a i think it might have just been a, a loosing the bond to leo containing his mars and leo and um that was the beginning of the yellow vest movement which he did not like I mean, you guess you could say he caused it or was the instigate or was the sort of catalyst for it, but he didn't have control over that. You know, mm-hmm. the loosening of the bond coincided with when this video went viral, which kind of kicked off the Yellow Vest uh, movement, um, which was, which, and it's funny because even the, the images, you know, of uh, those Yellow Vest protests, you know, is everyone in these big Yellow Vests? You're thinking Mars and Leo, you know, <laughs> sure. instead of wearing these sort of yellow, you know, the kind of almost like uh, hornets, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> or something. Um so this is this big sort of uh, political, you know, politically sort of hazardous time for him. And he actually goes into a, a major level Leo period right before the next election. Um, oh, this so, upcoming one? Yeah, the, okay. the upcoming French election. So I think, uh, you know, <laughs> you can understand, like, based on, you know, the, the past, uh, you know, history, like why it would be pretty straightforward to say, you know, Oh, hello, cat. Yeah, yes. uh, that, <laughs> uh, that um, you know, he's probably not going to uh, wow. make through, you know, get, get, be elected next time. So it's, um, it's, it's kind of eerie because, I mean, it, you get basically getting into insight into things that you shouldn't know. I mean, that's kind of what astrology <laughs> is for. Uh, is for <laughs> um, you know, you're, being, you're getting a kind of insider information. Mm-hmm. Um, so before we kind of head out, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, we, we talked about it uh, for a minute there, but I want to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, what you called the Trump's humiliation sequence. Yeah. Um, you said um, it's something that here at us now in January of 2021, it has started or it is about to begin. It, it's, it's, uh, all, it already started. Yeah. Um, okay. So, okay. so yeah, back in so November is when it started kind of officially. The, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on how how wide you want to zoom. Um, basically, the reason I called it the humiliation dropout sequence is because I noticed when I looked at the Zadok releasing, releasing sequences for every time that he's dropped out of a political race, he had this combination of Capricorn and Aries. Um, and he has run for... he. He dropped out on October 23rd, 1987, or October 22nd, 1987, which just happens to be the day before I was born. Um, <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> uh, which, well, it's kind of, well, it stuck out to me. And, and so that's when I started kind of tracking it. He also- like I am part of his humiliation. Yeah, there sequence. you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I was born at the humiliation sequence. So uh, he also dropped out of his run for his run in 2000 um and on like february 14th uh, he like did the, well he dropped up before that but then he like released this uh article basically just saying like i was so mistreated um as, as you and do. <laughs> yeah as you do and then uh he also uh he also was going to run for new york governor in 2014 and he dropped oh, out really? of that he dropped out of course of the 2012 election twice uh, oh. once on May 16th, 2011. And then again on like February 2nd of 2012, um, when it was kind of basically too late for him to continue, uh, running. Oh. And, uh, and the, so 
basically, like I kind of said before, his his dropping out on May 16th, 2011, the most direct corollary of that time period corresponds to this time period from like October 3rd or something to like November, uh, late November of, of 2020. And so that coincided with the, uh, in fact, the, the, the ultra precise, you know, uh, repetition of that sequence happened not on the day of the election, but on the day it was announced that they had called it for Biden, which was mm. like three days later. Yeah, three days later. So, um, so this was, so yeah. I was, so I was wrong. It was, um, an October to November kind of a thing and not a, it was, a, uh, actually, actually let me, um, here, let me uh, see if I can find the image so the beginning of the humiliation sequence when he entered this uh capricorn l2 that was when he first came out with this um you know nonsense about uh how you can you know drink bleach oh oh great (laughs) you know when this started (laughs) that that was yeah that was it, it was uh yeah so a kind of um here i can uh share my screen here if you don't mind sure here, you should be able to. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Do it there. So basically, these this column here is the the level one period. <laughs> so the first one was thirty years. Next one was twelve. Mm-hmm. Next one fifteen. Next one eight. And so it was July eighth of two thousand ten that he entered this Gemini period, and that was the um, this was right as the like uh, ground zero mosque controversy was happening, mm-hmm. and like Trump kind of got involved in that. Uh, saying he would be willing to like buy the property that it was on, and seemingly this began the time when he, you know, sensed there was a sort of opening or something, you know, uh, into tapping into these sorts of fears in the American populace because it was right after that that he came out with all this birth birth of stuff, kind of out of left field. Um, so he, it was in that time period from July eighth, two thousand ten, to February two thousand. 27th 2012 that encapsulates his his birther birtherism the subsequent uh you know humiliation uh in uh the beginning of may of 2011 and then him dropping out february 2nd of 2012 and so the uh the major level version of some of those events occurred uh basically from april 16th 2020 and, and 27 months thereafter sort of refers back to that May of 2011 period. So I was kind of expecting him to start, you know, having a sort of equivalent sort of uh, humiliation after April 16th. And this is when he was, yeah, going on about how, you know, drinking bleach and, you know, uh, imbibing light somehow <laughs> would like completely, you know, uh, cure you of COVID. And it's funny because he really backtracked that and he never backtracks anything usually. So he really, uh, he seemed to sense that that was kind of sort of crossed a line of ignorance there. And um, the, uh, the precise time that he had, uh, well, actually, I think I have this on a, I think I have this in my other article the fall and future of Trump. Here we go. I'll share this. So it's just, it's an easy way to see it. Um, so Gem- under his Gemini, Gemini, Capricorn, Aries sequence, that was, that is the date he dropped out of the 2012 race. It happened exactly from May 16th, 2011, 7.54 AM to May 19th, 2011, 10.54 AM. That was when he dropped out. So if Gemini, Gemini, Capricorn, Aries, was when he dropped out, then I'd expect Gemini Capricorn Aries to be the bigger version of that. And that was from October 5th, 2020 to November 12th, 2020. And when he reached Capricorn on the L4, that was from November 4th to November 10th. Um, And that was (laughs) the time period in which he, it was officially called uh, that he lost. So we can see this kind of connection between, you know, this time he dropped out, of the 2012 race and the time that he was defeated. Um, well, it's also interesting because like October 5th, that was, um, I believe right around the time he got his COVID diagnosis. Yeah, I think so. It was right and around that, like which is the, I, which... the idea of like, I can, I can see how catching the virus that you spent so long being like, oh, it's not a big problem can be, uh, 
can be right. a, a humiliation dropout sequence. Oh, but, yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, I, and and actually, that had me worried for a second because I was like, that sounds more like a fortune event, you know, than a spirit one. Um, oh, that's so again, true. Yeah, that's kind of, and that's kind of the complicating thing about this. You know, what can what is truly of someone's volition versus what's, you know, something just sort of circumstantial that happens to them. But I think that you know the decision to drop out is definitive that's a that's a spirit event you know not a fortune event yeah because um, that's the thing that you're deciding and yeah you know, with your own volition to do and accomplish right and i guess and i guess the way that this works is a spirit event because although he couldn't control who voted for him or how the vote was going to turn out I, I guess this is the beginning really in some ways of his denial of of you know what had happened so it's uh it, it can be complicated oh and i also found this this uh neat pattern of this sort of rising gemini capricorn aries theme you know the so the first iteration was dropping out of the 2012 race under gemini gemini capricorn aries but then he actually had to begin this presidential transition team in case he lost the 2020 election he was l- legally mandated to begin that process on april 30th of 2020 which just happened to be under Gemini, Capricorn, Capricorn, Aries. And so then he reaches like the kind of the big boy version of this, um, you know, under, uh, uh, by November 7th. Um, so that's, and then even, even more hilariously is the fact that, you know, on inauguration day itself, he reaches like a doubling up of this Gemini, Capricorn, Gemini, Capricorn, which is highlighting his Mercury and Saturn in the 12th. So, which kind of gives you this impression of, you know, being in a, a weakened state or a, a defeated uh, kind of uh, state, so being, um, you know, sort of exiled or what have you, you know, overcome by one's enemies, one might say. So it's, uh, it's really just an amazing, um, you know, uh, pattern of correspondence. And I'm going to say this kind of level of analysis with ZR is only possible when you have, uh, you know, a lot of sort of biographical data to kind of start picking up these patterns. If you're just using astrological theory to interpret what these periods are about, you're not going to be able to arrive at these kinds of precise things. Like, I mean, I might, because for example, I might know, okay, Gemini Capricorn, that's highlighting his Mercury and Saturn, probably not great times for him because of the placement of those planets in this chart, but I wouldn't necessarily have been able to work without any of his biography and tell you that this is exactly when it was going to happen. Um, the only things that I would have been able to really point to without knowing anything about his career is are the peak periods, which would have included the 2016 um, victory. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're talking about kind of the low point in Trump's life and, you know, a couple of them from the past, uh, but, you know, fortune is a fickle mistress and yeah. we're not always on a downswing, but there might actually be something of a, of an upswing coming up in the in the in the somewhat future for for Trump, assuming that um, yeah. he lives long enough to see it again. If he lives long enough to see it, then in the same way that he left the GOP on December twenty first, two thousand eleven, which happens at this loosing of the bond to Sagittarius mm-hmm. again, there's that Leaving. loosing theme. Yeah, <laughs> then we would expect a similar development as of November six, twenty twenty seven which I am interpreting as, you know, is that would be like forming a new political party distinct from the Republican party. And um, I would presume that in a similar way that he did this specifically to run for president again, that it would coincide with this. And the only election that's happening in that time frame that would make any sense would be 2028. Mm-hmm. And um, interestingly enough, the 2028 election, uh, uh, you know, is scheduled currently, you know, to occur um, in on November 7th, which is okay. like right after he would have entered this uh, Capricorn period. But interestingly, he only reaches the, the exact, you know, the full extent of that kind of negative uh, sequence by November 14th to November 17th. So I don't know if that just means like it sort of takes that long to figure out that, you know, that's what the result of the mm. race is or what have you. Um, it's making a lot of assumptions, but you can see how sure. this is yeah, mirrored foreshadowed by well. what, yeah, it's sort of mirrored up to this point. So past his prologue, this is sort of what we'd have to expect. It just doesn't make any sense right now. Yeah. The, well, I don't think it's a big, I don't think it's a big, uh, 
a big leap to say that he's not going away unless right. something, you know, something happens to him in some capacity. I, um, yeah, I will say uh, one big thing I would expect in between this, the only thing he did in between this time of leaving the GOP um, and when he quit the 2012 race was he released this book. The Art which, of the Deal? <clears throat> no, no, that was oh. 1987. Oh, that, he released oh, that, that book is much older than I thought it would. <laughs> yeah, Art of, Art, I'm sorry. Of, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, the, the book he released in in 2011 late 2011 was is called something like making america like work again or great again basically a a riff kind of on the yeah um you know on his, his, his eventual uh, campaign slogan. slogan exactly yeah so it, it, i think that this will definitely be a period of like self-promotion and maybe trying to pay off some of his debts through a sale of memoirs or, sure. or something you know it will just be a book of they were really me you know mean to me yeah you know? whatever um so uh that <laughs> that's the uh, that's what i would expect in in this time in fact if we found the publication date of that book then we might know we might actually get closer to the time that we might expect like another um uh, okay so it's called arrive. it was called time to get tough make america great again and it was okay. originally published on december 5th 2011 december 5th 2011 okay so that was in the taurus period then before the Sagittarius loosing so we would then expect a similar sort of campaign tome to emerge mm, on the 27th, uh, March um, 11th 2027 to November 6 2027 something that uh and it might not necessarily be a book I mean it could be even like a I don't know documentary or yeah <laughs> or uh, something which kind of you know is sort of presented by him as this way of saying you know, pay attention to me or, or <laughs> hey, or, remember me? <laughs> yeah, and and then and then the Sagittarius loosing. Well, because I imagine you know if he raises his head again, by that point the GOP is probably going to be like you know, get out of here. And then yeah. he might go like, okay, well, fine, screw you guys. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna do my own okay. thing. So I feel like, and the one kind of weird thing is, while he will be super old at this point, <laughs> he will be really close to his Uranus return. Oh, that's true. And he was born with the Sun conjunct Uranus, and you can even track kind of the different phases of his career through the different signs that Uranus goes through. So the fact that Uranus will be coming back to his natal Uranus in Gemini, in close to his Sun, I mean, it's provided he gets the. I would think that would be a pretty significant transit. That would be like the when he when Trump is at his most Trumpian, mm. um, you know, if it can be imagined. Um, um, okay, I just got <laughs> so, a little scared there for a yeah, second. No, it, it's, <laughs> oh god, yeah, it's, it's fairly <laughs> okay. terrifying. But um, yeah, that's the <laughs> that's that's uh, the fact that this is all happening at the time that he'll be close to his Uranus return is another thing that kind of makes me go like, yeesh. You know, if he gets the it, what's also kind of crazy about this is that Capricorn period only comes in on October 31st, 2028, just days before the 2028 election. And it's usually during those Sagittarius periods that he is doing pretty well, because that's his fortune 10 period. So it will almost be like, it will almost seem like he has it until very late in the process. Uh, um, well, and you know, part of this is also, yeah, yeah. So kind of like you said, it, it assumes a lot. It assumes, it assumes that, a like, lot. It assumes that like this impeachment thing doesn't happen, which, yeah, you know, it, it, it could not, it could not happen because one yeah. of the things with being impeached is um, you can't hold office again. So if that happens, then obviously this context is going to have to change. Exactly. You know, or, uh, you know, so we, we're, just not, we're not sure. Dead, you know? <laughs> or he could just you drop know? dead and none of this matters. Right. Because he doesn't I mean, then, yeah, exactly. So it's, it, and uh, I guess that would be a whole other topic of discussion is looking at, uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, um, well, and, you know, and some of it is like, uh, yeah, he might not be there anymore to, right. to like, to have this, but like, does he become like some sort of symbol in some way that lives on past his right. little coil or like, you know, what, we'll, well see. I, think I guess one, we'll see. <laughs> one way or another, I, I think that's probably pretty likely <laughs> um, that, right, yeah. uh, you know, he'll be, he'll, 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 he won't be forgotten. Um, uh, just uh, probably not the way he'd prefer. Um, <laughs> so that is, uh, that's, that's how I kind of, had the confidence to to put this out there even though it doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense intuitively yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well it's all very fascinating stuff obviously very well very well researched because you have to research somewhat to be able to understand what these things are talking about and right uh, you know what what events that might be foreshadowing based on what's happened all right well is there anything else that you wanted to kind of 
Uh, well, um, any other topics you wanted to kind of cover? Well, I mean, I'm, I guess the, the thing that I keep getting asked and the thing that I'm always sort of thinking about, and I, I wonder what your impression of this is, is how do you reconcile, you know, the great, the greater benefic and the greater malefic being together? Uh, you know, people ask me, is this good or bad? And I don't know how to answer because, uh, we are both. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and, uh, I think it's one of those things. So, you know, asking whether or talking about whether, um, you know, these, the conjunction is good or bad. I think it depends a bit on what the context is and who you're looking for or like who you're looking at it for. Right. Cause one thing I've always kind of described it as, or like seen it, if I was like drawing like a cartoon picture of it is it's like Jupiter is like this half inflated balloon and Saturn's like a rock that's tied around the string. That's just like barely off the ground. And they're just kind of like, like that's the, that's the dynamic. Like it is Jupiter's a, it, being was, held yeah. down. Saturn's being lifted up. Neither really, neither really like it, but that's just kind of how they yeah. are. Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It, you know, it's both. It's both. I mean, it depends on, it depends on what it's going to be. <laughs> right. Um, there's like this whole larger conversation because it is, you know, the great conjunction and it starts like this new 20 year chapter in the world. It's off to a rocky start. <laughs> uh, I don't <laughs> well, think no anybody... <laughs> thanks to the Mars and Uranus and all those other things, which are also interacting with it at this time. But, um, um, um and I, so it's, it's, but it's, it's always difficult. I think, you know, people look to astrologers for answers about the future in some capacity. Um, and it's difficult uh, especially with things like this that represent like these big shifts and things because it's like it's so hard to imagine things that aren't here yet and I know that sounds like a cop-out but like one no. of the things I like to point to is like you know if you look back at like um, um, like fields of industry that people are involved in and like the 1900s like almost 50 percent of american workers were involved in agriculture now it's down to like three four percent because of like the like nobody could have imagined like the the innovation that came that made it a lot easier the different fields that opened up that people went into um it's just like we just don't you don't lack imagine of, it until you see it. And it's yeah, like, lack oh. of imagination, I think, <laughs> is one of the biggest pro uh, hampering, uh, hampers to uh, making uh -huh. predictions because it's just, it, if something's outside of your imagination, that it might be hard to even, you know, conceive that it would be a thing, yeah. you know. Um, but I'm always really kind of intrigued by that. You know, like, for example, before 2020 started, I mean, everyone was so, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was hard to know how much to really lean into how bad it looked. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah absolutely. Cause it was like, what could this even be? You know? Yeah. Um, because one of the, one of the big, I mean, the two things I said about 2020 that I will take credit for, I didn't, I, I can say that I did not focus on the disease aspects of, uh, you know, Saturn transits or Saturn Pluto sure. uh, combinations. Although you can certainly find those people like Richard Tarnas talked about it at length. Um, in his book, uh, Cosmos and Psyche. But um, one of the things I think I did nail is that the uh, one of the recurring themes of Saturn and Capricorn periods is containment and confinement mm -hmm. of things, of people being kind of under stress or contained. Restricted. I, restricted quarantine. You know? right, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <That's, bing. laughs> yeah, I mean, there's that. I also, yeah, I also got the uh, prisoners being released and the set of ethical dilemmas about that. Um, I also managed to uh, predict that there would be some kind of end or resolution to the, uh, to the Afghanistan war uh, that started in 2001. And it, crazily enough, it was right around the conjunction that they, um, that they did come to uh, uh, that uh, sort of peace deal mm -hmm. uh, with the Taliban. Yeah, um, I think my only thing that I was like anticipating in 2020 was like another market crash. Which um, did happen. Which did happen, obviously not in the way I anticipated, uh, you know, <laughs> because it was precipitated by COVID right. concerns. I had no idea um, that was what it's going to be about. I did think early in the year though, but I didn't, uh, I didn't have like a date. Yeah. I thought I figured um, it'd be close to January. Yeah. And my thing for that was just back in 2008, when Jupiter was in Capricorn again, um, in a trine with Saturn, we had that crash and then yeah. them happening again, then being now conjoined. I was like, oh, I wonder if this is going to be. Yeah. 
Like Honestly, come back to the oh cycle my gosh, you know, it's funny. That's actually one, one big thing I got into over 2020 was financial astrology. And a, a lot of people seem to have been like, I've noticed yeah. a few people popping up that have been focused yeah, on it. I've been working a lot more with that. And that was one of the things I thought was going to happen with the Jupiter Saturn conjunction, uh, just because of how well that worked out in the 2000 Jupiter Saturn conjunction, timing out the uh, dot com crash. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, in many ways, is this arrangement, this current arrangement is very, very close to that. And the market it is significantly overvalued. I mean, <laughs> it is night and day, you know, in, a, in an era of mass imp- unemployment, right? Yeah, and it's rosy where people are dying 000. from this <laughs> virus. I mean, it, it makes no sense. It's completely divorced from any reality. Well, it's because they, because they're, crossing their fingers for more stimulus money. The, well, the crossing the fingers, uh, it, there's, there's uh, <laughs> yeah, we could say uh, euphoric hopes. And I would also say that, uh, um, you know, Federal Reserve uh, injections of cash have also helped keep uh, spirits high. But it's also such, you know, it is such an insult. So that precipitous. Federal, <laughs> well, the, the, well, it's such an insult that Fed, the Federal Reserve, you know, would, would seemingly, you know, just part with trillions and trillions of dollars without compunction to help people who, you know, already own millions. Meanwhile, you know, Congress is like, you know, uh, $2,000 you know, divided know. over whether or not like $600 is too much to give like an average person. And I think that's another thing that I really like about visiting with, um, you know, clients is I guess that also helps keep me connected to, you know, other people's experiences who are living like completely different like totally. lives than me. And I like, I see them suffering and I see what's happening, you know, in Washington, they are debating of whether or not 600 is enough or, you know, it's, it's like, it's just so, uh, it's, it's so infuriating <laughs> yeah. uh, to, you know, to see that. Cause it's just like, you know, how, how little are people worth, you know? Um, meanwhile, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's so, uh, let them tell you, let them, let them count yeah, the ways to you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very, uh, it's very upsetting. So, uh, yeah, that it's, um, the, this, uh, Jupiter Saturn thing. I, I still think that there's the possibility that, um, uh, if we see Jupiter as like optimism, enthusiasm, sure. and Saturn as kind of the great correction, that hopefully Jupiter's proximity oh. to Saturn would kind of engender a, a correction, <laughs> uh-huh. a Saturnian correction of this uh, unfounded optimism. But uh, Jupiter's starting to move away from Saturn now, so yeah, and quickly, I'm, yeah. So I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Has it happened yet? <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. I mean, time's running out. Hey, <laughs> I mean, math-wise, <laughs> sure. and you know, just. Uh, through i guess fundamental analysis that you can tell that uh this cannot continue right i mean this this cannot uh continue at the pace that it is but it's just a matter of when and i i gotta say financial astrology is definitely the slipperiest fish Uh i have ever chased in astrology it is it is um uh it is uh I know there's a lot of work that's been done on it, but it, it's, I, I can't tell whether people who've cracked the code are being forthcoming about what they've discovered. Totally. Right, 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 right. <laughs> um, you know, because uh, it, uh, it, it, some things you think would work don't seem to. And then oh. it's like this, there's like another set of rules in some oh, ways great. for dealing with this kind of. Um, some more lot switching. As well, <laughs> well, I gotta, you got, well, when you're wrong, this, then you gotta adjust you know, the way you've been looking at things, you have to try to figure out what, you know, what is the case? You can't just Mm -hmm. keep using a failed strategy. I mean, I'm sure, you know, skeptics, (laughs) traders would probably say, well, you should probably stop using astrology, but yeah. um, It's like, well, you guys aren't doing that much better. So, (laughs) right. Well, and that's kind of, that's sort of my response to that as well as well. I, you know, no one can explain, you know, why, um, why the market is so crazily, you know, uh, divorced from just common sense and the reality of the economy. You know, it's mm-hmm. the econ- we we now can say for certain that you know the health of the stock market has nothing to do yeah, about with- how well people are actually getting by, which I think should be the true measure. Well, it's actually kind of funny because I remember you know back oh lord, a couple of presidential cycles there was this big thing like Wall Street versus Main Street, mm-hmm. and now that like that conversation has just died completely. Like we no longer really have that as like a as like a concept. Like now, it's, I guess people it's are never so been invested. More stock. <laughs> yeah, but it's like yeah, it's never been more stark the difference. But now people are like so much more invested in um, 
the concept that, that like the healthy, like a, a good stock market means a healthy economy. And it might just be because the shoes on the other foot and the party that was saying that is the one that's now. Uh, in, I would also in, think in, that in one, power. yeah. Another thing that I think would really is making a huge difference this time as well is the fact that, um, is the fact that so many more millennials are now involved in trading. Like they're not yeah. necessarily millionaires, but they are, you know, they're using apps like Robin hood and they actually have some skin in the game and mm -hmm. people who've done like early investments in cryptocurrencies are yeah. seeing such phenomenal returns right now that uh, like you are seeing the average person finally being able to uh, benefit potentially from uh, these sort of uh, market movements, but it could end in tears. Um, yeah, absolutely. At any moment. You know, <laughs> at any moment. Although I, I got to say, I, I'm, I, I, uh, I, I experienced the, the loss of, uh, of, of uh, future profits. I thought that oh, the no. top of, I thought the top of Bitcoin was going to be that solar eclipse. So I took my money out right before it like shot um, up to 40,000. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I lost yeah. out of those Bitcoin things. You know, it's, it's easy okay. come, easy go. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's okay. I mean, it will come back down again. And there's a whole other discussion to have about that. Cause I think that one of the big problems with crypto and why it's so volatile is because people are treating it fundamentally as a commodity when it's actually a currency, uh -huh. um, oh, which is like not the way <laughs> we don't do that with anything else. You know, mm -hmm. imagine if people were doing this with like the Euro, yeah, the you know, yen, or like, the yen uh... or something <laughs> like that. That's not what this is for. This is a, you know, it's a, it's supposed to be a currency, not a, not a, it's not a stock. Um, but uh, in any case, so yeah, I've been I've been thinking a lot more about the astrology of finance this year, and it I sounds mean, like you have been too. <laughs> uh, I mean, I haven't really been thinking about it so much um, as just like watching other people be like more involved mm -hmm. with it or talk more about it. Um, who are millennials? Now that you mention it, yeah, uh, <laughs> right. Um, the rise of the millennial financial astrologer. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I don't yeah, know. it makes. I think. It, I mean. It makes sense to some. I mean, I guess really the stock market should be like for the public and average person. I think the the original idea of the stock market is that you know the 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 citizens of a country would be able to partake of the country's economic success when you know almost like a giant co-op. Like if the fortunes of the country rise, then so should the shares held by the citizens. The I think that uh, the people who have the most to lose or the most to gain, you know, have tried to uh, ob obfuscate this process and make it seem like it's not for the average person. And in many cases, people don't have like the extra money to be able to even make, you know, an investment or buy a share. Like, and they're struggling with just surviving. So why would they care about, you know, the looking at a good stock to invest in? I mean, it's, I think there's, um, but I do think that in the, in the, among millennials we're seeing just sort of pockets here and there of people who maybe have just enough money to get involved in it and um and thus uh you know there's just a more interest in it just because there's actually there's the it's accessible you know there's um you know robin hood makes it really easy to just go and, and i think the the ethos of that app i think is also you know pretty uh, succinctly uh, summed up by its name, right? I mean, this is this is a way that millennials can buy into uh, getting into the stock market if they see it as, you know, sticking it to the man. <laughs> and that's certainly a way that I, I see it. I'd like to thank Robin Hood for sponsoring this video. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A free advertising. <laughs> I do not use Robin Hood just, oh, yeah. for, uh, just for clarification. Um, but yeah, and, and I also think that like finances are one of those things that um, is another well-documented thing that let that leads it to be able to be tracked alongside cycles. Yeah. Uh, you can always go back and look at you know what what a different stock or commodity market was doing at a certain date, and you know find the find whatever was going on with that that you think might be going on. Um, so, and I actually <laughs> I I really love the internet because it has made a lot of this searching for information and times and dates and stuff um, a lot easier than I imagine it was beforehand. I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah, I mean, really, this is an amazing, this this could not be in a more, a more amazing time to be an astrologer and be into astrology because we have tools at our disposal that like would just make Ptolemy's head fall off. Like, I mean, you know, this is, this is, uh, 
just you know phenomenal you know what you can actually do i take it for granted every day but um you know when you really think about it it's extraordinary yeah and it's easy to take for granted but all right patrick thank you so much for being here and talking with me today <laughs> one final question for you yeah if there's any technique in astrology that you think somebody ought to pick up look more into or put more credence in what would it be and why and is it zodiacal releasing no <laughs> oh okay okay uh no i don't because i think that um not that i don't think it's super important but i just don't think it should be considered a fundamental technique i think that's it's uh, I feel like it's a, it's, it's a gem, which you kind of have to do sort of the groundwork for before accessing. I think someone who's entering on the ground level, you know, should not, you know, go into the, the advanced section uh, just yet. Um, but I think that the best astrology teacher is looking at what's happened. So I would say the best thing that you could do, or the best, I guess, the most essential astrological technique someone should learn is transits and transit cycles and the best way to do that is to open up a spreadsheet and um you know uh, make a list of the number of years you've lived so far and try to remember what happened in each of those years of your life and with as much with as many specific dates as possible create a chronology a timeline of your life and match it up with the ephemeris and see where this planet saw and if there are certain times where a planet returns to the same position, because that will give you insight, which you might not even be able to see just from your natal chart alone. Say for example, you were born at a Venus Jupiter square. Well, the fact that those two planets are in an angular relationship could indicate that you would have a kind of resonant relationship with that planetary pair. And you may see a kind of recurring theme as Venus and Jupiter reach a square with each other at different points in your life um or even conjunctions and oppositions you may notice a sort of theme that's associated with that planetary pair and you would only be able to get that kind of insight by seeing how it's actually played out in your life and most of the time this does seem to back up like what we'd kind of expect from astrology but sometimes there are surprises um and uh, uh you know, for example, you, you might think that Venus transits are usually sort of nice or pleasant, but you may notice like if you have a particular resonance or affinity with Venus retrogrades, that uh, maybe it's not so pleasant <laughs> in your life, you know, uh, sort of, so the, really your own life, your chronology, and, it's, and how it matches up with transits and, and, and transits in a cyclical context, I think is one of the most important things that someone can can look at and learn because it is it's pure astrology you know it's it's the most basic and essential form of it uh you know is is just studying the sky and looking at what happened um you know because it's it it's kind of goes back to those the fundamental roots of astrology of uh, babylonian uh omen uh omen watching. watching you know and uh it just going back to okay you know, this amazing thing happened in my life, what was happening in the chart, like mm -hmm. what was happening in the sky. And uh, that will be your best teacher is uh, history and your life. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. Curveball. Very good. Very good <laughs> advice because you can use it for almost anything after that. Exactly. As long as you've got yes. that time, you can use it for anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly That's right. Man. Yeah. You could use it for any, you know, whether you're looking at solar rocks or. So everybody go dig out your journals from middle school <laughs> yeah. and, you know, put all that stuff in a, in a, in a spreadsheet. Well, yeah, and and ZR as well. That, that's that's really important. You know, you get uh, if you remember, you know, whenever you got like rejected at the school dance, <laughs> uh, you know. Oh no! Uh, you know, don't you ask might, anybody out on a date if you see those patterns yeah, come back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You might see that Have come back. You're like, oh god, you know, the large vote. This is the you know magnified uh, episode of when I got you know dumped at the middle school dance. You know, Dang. You, yeah, your your past is uh, still happening. Mm. All right. That sounded a little haunting, but with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Patrick, for being here with no us today. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. All right.